So some people have asked me to get different perspectives on the coronavirus situation. We've got Dr. Paul Cottrell on right now. I know it's going to be controversial for some people. Having done a cursory look at the history of pandemics and viruses, I can see how these things jump from pigs to birds to horses and back and forth and mutate. And I believe that something would have come out of the animal world and hit humankind like this anyway. I've also looked at the fact that there was a level four bioweapons lab in Wuhan where they were experimenting on this kind of stuff uh, in preparation for vaccines. So it is paramount, I think, that people look at all of the different angles. And that's what we're doing on this channel, trying to get people on to give the expertise. So appreciate you coming on, Paul. Could you just say what your background is and what your interest in this subject is, please? Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I have an undergrad degree um, at Wayne State University, an MBA in finance, also at Wayne State University. I have a PhD at Walden University specializing in finance, um, algorithmic trading, artificial intelligence using uh, dynamic hedging. And then, um, then uh, basically when I was doing my dissertation, my brother passed away from heart disease at an early age, 30, 36 years old. Oh, so after I finished my, my PhD, I decided to go into medicine. So to go into medicine, you have to do a pre-med program. So I did my pre-med program at uh, Fordham University in New York, where I live, New York City. And then um, I'm finishing up my master's in biology at Harvard University. And then, uh, then I'll be going to medical school. So I wanted to go into, you know, cardiac, you know, cardiac surgery because of what happened to my brother. But um, <clears throat> what interested me with this uh, particular uh, situation was my coursework at, at Harvard dealt with bioinformatics and studying uh, genomic sequences. I did a work in, in um, um, cancer at, at Harvard also, um, molecular biology. So I just had a, just a just an interest. So when they published the sequence uh, f from China on the Wuhan, the Wuhan virus, um, I just had just an intellectual interest to look at the NIH database because we were trained to use that database and do blast search searches based on our bioinformatic coursework. So I just was, just had that interest in it. So I said, well, what would it look like? So it w it's about uh, 30,000 base pair RNA virus that was sequenced. And when you do a blast search, you can see other organisms that have similar homology. Well, when I did that, voila, what came out was 20 different, different um, SARS or bat SARS-like viruses that, that match the Wuhan. And because of my information uh, or my knowledge in molecular biology, we learn on how to do um, bioengineering, you know, with, with viruses, uh, uh, plasmids to do lab research, cancer research or, you know, studying bacteria or whatever, because that's, that's what happens in a, in a bio, you know, in, in a uh, molecular biology lab. Well, I could see right away that they took the best of both worlds. We had a bat SARS-like virus and a SARS virus. And uh, the bat SARS virus uh, had um, a better replicase, which allows you to uh, multiply the proteins and the RNA within the cell and the SARS that had the better S-spike protein. And you could see huge chunks being copy pasted into the genome of the Wuhan. Uh, at that time, we only had five uh, sequences from, from China. Uh, now we have many more because it's spread over the world and, you know, each area has been sequencing their own. So we have a minimum of 35 Wuhan strands. And then we have one sequence that's called RATG13 that seems to be a, been a branch off of the Wuhan. Um, then there was a paper that came out uh, shortly after I did that. Uh, early February. So I did all this stuff um, late, late January 
I started January 25th. I did another one, another uh, analysis on, on January 27th. And our early February was when the Indian researchers said, uh, well, there's, there's HIV homology in the spike protein. So I went into the NIH database, looked at the, the sequence. You can look at RNA sequences or protein sequences. So I looked at the protein sequences and saw the four insertions at the S uh, protein or the spike protein. And um, that is the protein, for ones that don't know, that actually docks into a receptor. So at that time, we knew that it was going to dock into the ACE2 receptor. So that paper kind of focused on the four uh, insertions, uh, HIV homology. I saw it, confirmed it. Um, fast track, you know, to just about a week ago, talking about the RATG13, uh, that also has the HIV homology. And that's why we think it, that's, that, that's spun off of Wuhan. There is a little bit of stochastic changes um, uh, in the RATG13 for the gag insertion of the HIV, um, but it's almost exact for the glycoprotein 120. So at that time, you know, it was like, whoa, something's not right here. This was bioengineered. Um, and then while trying to investigate why was it bioengineered, you can kind of see in the literature going all the way back to 2010, maybe as far back as 2008, them building this up in the different research labs and different people were publishing and they wanted to understand why the bat is the, the, the natural host. So they kind of supercharged this virus to understand what's going on in, in the natural kingdom. So when someone says it's bioengineered, it doesn't mean bioweapon, but that doesn't mean that they can't use it as a bioweapon. So probably what happened, I think, because there's you know, uh, Francis Boyle, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Boyle has said, well, maybe it was sold and it's a bioweapon. I think this is what happened. In 2000, around 2010, they were starting to, to modify this, this and, and, and add chunks and build this, what we'll call the Wuhan virus, okay? Probably around 2015, there was probably a split. While you still had, let's say, scientific discovery, scientific bioengineering, there probably was a split around 2015 where it went blackout. And so you might, ha you might have had a scientific study and then this more bioweapon development thing that, that's going on. Uh, I've been more focused on the scientific one because I at least can track that in the literature. So it, you can't, you're not going to be able to track a, a, a black op, uh, you know, you know, weapon system. But um, that's, you know, that's basically, you know, what happened. And over time, I've been able to, this, looking at other research papers and other individuals that have been helping me on, on my on my YouTube channel. I kind of have a little army of 34,000 people, you know, helping. Um, so it's a team effort. Uh, but there are multiple receptors. It's not just ACE2. There are many receptors that have been recently discovered that this could utilize and why there is some disparities on infection rates around the world. And that explains like some... Some uh, ethnicities will upregulate different receptors, not just ACE2. So, and that's, I think, the, the part of the explanation why we're seeing the explosion of, of uh, infections, let's say in Iran and in, in Italy. It's not just, it's, it's a very complex problem. It's not just, it's not just uh, receptor upregulation. It's also sociological, how we behave in a society but not all those factors are equally weighted. So, you know, and I think in the mainstream, they, they've been focused on more of the sociological reasons, um, how people behave in a society uh, and why it was spreading. But I think that there is a, a very big uh, biological component that's different, dealing with the upregulation of the receptors.
So some of your scientific vernacular has flown over my head. I imagine it has to some of my viewers as well. HIV oh, homology. <laughs> what, what does HIV homology mean? Okay, so basically what it means is that the, A, the HIV virus, uh, one of the viruses of HIV-1 uh, is the known virus that get, you know, is AIDS, right? So um, that is a retrovirus. Coronavirus is not a retrovirus. They're both RNA viruses, but their mechanisms and how they work inside the cell when they're infected are totally different, totally different. But you can take bits and pieces of one genome and supercharge it in another. So what they did was they, they took the glycoprotein 120, which is the spike protein of HIV, pieces of it, and put it into the spike protein for coronavirus. Now, what that means is, is that it allowed uh, certain charges, um, proteins are neutral. So when you have a sequence of amino acids, you'll have these like minor, you know, um, or what we call partial charges, partial negative, partial positive charges. And then your receptor will have the same kind of partial, partial charges around there. So if they're opposite, and when they dock, if they're opposite enough, then it docks well. So it's not just the topology, but it's also the, char the, the opposite charges have to be correct for it to dock correctly in, in, into the receptor to c come into the cell. So um, if you have four inserts, three of them coming for the glyco, uh, the, the glycoprotein 120, which is the spike protein of HIV, okay, virus, three separate insertions plus one insertion for gag, which is tied into the capsid uh, assembly, for that to happen zoonotically is very rare. One insertion, maybe two, yeah, that may be zoonotic, but four? And then I, I kept on like going, what's going on with the white blood cell drop on some of these patients? Well, we have, we, there are researchers that have found, and I published on, on my, my YouTube site, that it's not just the ACE2 receptor, but it involves something called DC uh, sign and L sign. They're two different, re, two different receptors. Uh, L sign receptor is a major receptor for HIV docking. Of its, of its spike protein, which is GP120, which is part of the inserts, the three inserts that are in the coronavirus. So what am I saying? I'm saying that there are bits and pieces of HIV that supercharges the spike protein in the coronavirus that docks not only in ACE2, but also docks on l sign receptor, which is also called CD299, and that is a, a major receptor for HIV. So do you think that this was released accidentally then? 65% of, 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 let's say, the, the scientific hat would say it was accidentally released from the P4 facility. It, it was definitely released by the P4 facility. The question is, was it released on accident or on purpose? 65% of, 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 let's say, the intellectual pursuit here would say it was accidental uh, due to poor safety protocols. But there's a 35% chance that it was done on purpose. Um, if, you, if it was done on purpose, what do you suspect the motive would be? That's a dark road. That's a really dark road. And um, I'd rather assume that it was done on accident. But if it was done on purpose, um, it may be program calling of the population um, uh, and it instituting um, a, like a one health government. Uh, you know, there's this one world government. If, if people pay attention to Agenda 21 or Agenda 30, part of that 
agenda is what they call One Health. And One Health is a global health. And then if you, if you, if you subscribe to the idea that it was purposely released, that and you look at how the, the WHO has basically placated to China, kind of kowtowed to China, afraid to question China and, and, and their, their numbers and how they treated this early on in Wuhan, um, it makes you think that they are rolling out some sort of one, you know, one health agenda. That's a subset of Agenda 21, Agenda 30. Um, so it, it's I, it's probably a, a globalization play. So if it is engineered like this, looking at previous pandemics, Spanish flu lasted over a year, bubonic plague lasted five years. Do you expect this will mutate and there will be further waves? If we look at the epidemiological curves of the Spanish flu of 1918, uh, there was a um, there there were multiple waves. There was you know a, a primary wave, a secondary wave, and a, and a smaller tertiary wave. Um, that's the best evidence, the best proxy that we have of what this would probably be. Now the Spanish flu was zoonotic. This is not zoonotic. So the dynamics, it might be a fallacy to use that as a, as a proxy, all right? I do know this. There are multiple receptors, and I called it pinballing. So if one receptor loses affinity, normally, let me backtrack, normally when a, when a virus is newly introduced in a population, you'll have a spike in, in activity, and then it'll start to die down. It's called attenuation. So as it's attenuating through the population, it starts to weaken. The reason why is the replicase isn't very good because viruses don't have um, like proofreading mechanisms like we have. Higher, higher organisms have more proofreading mechanisms as it's, multi, as it's duplicating its, its, its genome. So the replicase makes lots of mistakes. So there's lots of mutations. But through natural selection, it, it can either become very virulent or it can normally, normally, viruses will attenuate in the population and just kind of live within the population and not just kill everything off, right? I mean, someone could just do the mind experiment. Ebola is very deadly, but it dies off so quickly that it can't learn to live in the population. Now, my fear is because there's so many receptors that this can, can deal with, all right? It can deal with ACE2, it can deal with GRP78, it can deal with CD147, it can deal with uh, CD209 and CD299 and maybe others um, that it'll pinball, where it'll attenuate from one, lose affinity, let's say ACE2, but gain affinity later down the road for let's say CD147. And so my concern here is, is that yes, there will be a secondary wave and a tertiary wave, but my, but my real worry is, is that it stays dormant for five or six years and then gains function and virulence and pops back up just like how it is right now, five or 10 years later. And so, there, that's, that's my bigger concern. I'm more concerned about what's going to happen five or 10 years later than actually right now. So in the mainstream and even on Joe Rogan, we've seen doctors get interviewed who are convinced it crossed over from animals. Are there other people in the scientific and medical community that you're working with that are corroborating your perspective? Well, here, here's the thing is you can look at it three different ways. You can look at it from a, a bio, bioinformatic way, a purely statistical way, and, and the paper trail. And all three vectors point to the same conclusion, and that is it was bioengineered. And let me give you, I explained on how it was bioinformatic where there's huge copies, all right? You're talking, when I say huge copies, I'm talking about 2,000 nucleotide and it took the best 
of both worlds. They took the best from bad SARS like and put in 2,000 nucleotide paste and then about a little bit more than 500 nucleotide paste for the spike protein from SARS. And then they, they put a cherry on the top with the, the four inserts of HIV. For all those things to be zoonotic, if you look at it from the, the statistical point of view, that would mean that a bat would have to have bat SARS-like virus, SARS virus, and AIDS to have them tra translocate. It's called translocation. For them to accidentally chunks be put in to to the genome then then it being at a p4 lab that's next to a fish market if you add all of that up you know it's probability it's it, 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 you got to times it each one of those things it's like 0.0001% chance that all of these things could have been zoonotic so could it have been zoonotic? Yes, but the probability is so low that, you, that scientific, to be sci scientifically honest, you would have to assume that it is bioengineered. So that's just the pure statistics of it, okay? If you look at the, bi the bioinformatic of the genomes, you can see the big copy-paste. I mean, it's very, anyone, you don't even have to have a, molecular biology knowledge or bioinformatic knowledge. You just see the genomes and you can see the copy paste, all right? So you got two vectors that are pointing to bioengineering because when you see something that zoonotically is changing and then and it gains function, you, you see it's stochastic, but you don't get these big chunks in the two most important areas of the genome, the replicase and the spike protein, that doesn't happen zoonotically. With HIV, no. So, um, and then if you look at the paper trail, you can see that Dr. Uh, Pyong Zhao and others were using bat SARS-like and SARS virus to um, understand how the bat host was the host. What was, what, was the, what was the biological mechanism and how the virus could go underneath the radar of the immune system to live with the host. So they can design therapeutics um, or vaccines for SARS, because this is SARS. This, is, this virus is SARS. And a lot of people don't say, that it's, you know, they say COVID-19. COVID-19 is the disease, okay? What, what is the disease? SARS-CoV-2. This is SARS. And, and it's not really, it's not projected in the news. But in the, the scientific nomenclature of this virus that we're dealing with is SARS. And we know how scared and deadly that is. And they, su they supercharged it in the lab to study it, okay? Now, maybe in 2015, there was a black op. And we don't know because there's no way we could paper trail that. But if you look at the paper trail of how they were building this up in the, in the, in the, in the literature, and, and, and publishing how the bat is the host and how SARS works, you can see this developing. You can see how this was being engineered through all, you know, not all, but a lot of different labs around the world, Canada, the United States, and, and, and China. So you can see the literature using this as kind of a model. So it's not out of the, the realm of possibility that this is, that this is bioengineered. This is, so I'm, I'm looking at three separate vector points and they're all, the three separate vectors and they're, they're all pointing to the same, the same conclusion, bioengineered. I wish it wasn't, but it is, it is, is it, yeah. it is bizarre that they had the, the level four weapons lab in Wuhan experimenting on this and then the outbreak is there. definitely bizarre. Um, and but, but here's, here's another point. Here's another point though. A lot of, a lot of researchers that have a lab they get grants from the government, all right, and they don't want to say something that might that might tip the apple cart for for their research. You know, so people need to to you know think that well, people that are saying that it, that it's zoonotic, 
where is their funding coming from? And a lot of that funding that that that, that are say, that that are saying it's not that that saying that it's zoonotic is usually coming from government funding. And the governments need the, they they you know they need this they need this funding to maintain their their lab. But not only that, the government needs their lab to possibly do the black ops. So I mean, there's a symbiotic. The point I'm making is there's a symbiotic relationship between the government and these individuals saying it's zoonotic. Because if people, if if people wake up and realize what has been going on in the, some of these research labs, and the protocols, and the ethics issues that are that are happening, um, it may shut the, it may, it may shut it down. People might. See, the problem is, is that the, the average citizen doesn't fully understand what is going on in these labs and how they are, how they're manipulating genomes and how, you know, how deadly these things could be. A, a, a P4 or a BSLA, a BSL4 lab, that's a deadly, that's, that's a deadly pathogen. So, um, you know, I, I, unfortunately, the, the, the scientific level baseline um, for our society is relatively low in, in, in this particular discipline. So if that was released accidentally or maybe even intentionally, wouldn't that be a declaration of war on the U.S. and my country? Yeah, yeah. And this is what, you know, this is what, see, here's, if you go down the, the road of it was uh, on, if you go down the road that it was purposely released, who purposely released it and why? You know, was it Western society that had a, a mole in the P4 lab and leaked it out to try to weaken the Chinese to pull down the CCP? Maybe, because the CCP has already published that one, they wanted to do espionage with the Thousand Talent Plan that was published in 2008. Uh, a Harvard professor was caught with espionage with that and some graduate students in, in Boston. Um, uh, researchers in, uh, in uh, Canada were caught with uh, stealing, you know, stealing um, uh, material. So maybe it was the Western... Uh, countries that try to weaken the, the Chinese. But I don't think that's, I don't think that's the case. Um, maybe it was a dissident that was trying to pull down the CCP that's actually Chinese. Um, it's possible. Miles uh, Go, I mean, he, he seems to be a, per, a, you know, a potential character in this, uh, you know, and he seemed to have a, some inside information before things started leaking out of, of Wuhan on what was going on. So that's why I'm saying there's something, something's going on with the CCP, some sort of try to the overthrow or something like that. Is it potential that the Chinese leaked it on their own population, knowing that maybe some of these receptors are more upregulated in Caucasians because they are DC sign and L sign are more upregulated in Caucasians than Asians, but ACE2 is, it seemed as though that, that um, uh, more males will uh, have it than females. Uh, um, early, early investigation was saying that Asian males have more ACE2, but I, that still hasn't been fully, fully explored. I think the, the power of that study is a little low, but it's possible that these receptors that we're talking about, oh, we may be white males, may actually be more susceptible to, to this than any other ethnicity or sex. So uh, if the Chinese knew this, uh, they could have done this, leak it out, leak it out into the population first in China. It would spread around the world. When we start getting sick in the Western world, they would be starting to get better and it will allow them to institute their 2025 plan, which is to control the first island chains and thinking that the United States would be sick 
they would they wouldn't be able to fight a a uh, a Pacific battle. Um, but that's speculative. I mean, there, I don't ha- I don't have any scientific proof. That's more kind of like game, you know, more like war gaming, Pentagon war gaming, than anything else. Um, uh, I that's why I said sixty five percent of of my of my uh, thinking was that it was accidentally released from the P four lab. Definitely bioengineered. I have no doubt it was bioengineered. But the question really is: is why did it leak out? But I, 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 just for my own sanity, I would prefer <laughs> that it was accidental because it's a really dark road if, if it was on purpose. And who did it? You know, was it a CIA black op operation to pull down the CCP? Was it, um, was it a glo- globalization move to, you know, to try to institute this One Health and an enforced vaccination program? On my channel, I've been, I look at this problem uh, multifaceted. It's, it's the scientific, the biological, you know, the pathogenic kind of pillar. There is the financial pillar, and then there is the, the sovereignty pillar, all right, or, you know, the, the legality pillar. And I'm seeing that, one, it's, it's devastating for our own health, but it's also devastating to the economy. I mean, we're, we're going to go into a depression, the whole world will go into a depression. We haven't seen anything like this before. It's like 1929 with Spanish flu all at once, right? And we have a much more interconnected world and everything is, you know, uh, computerized where everything happens faster. So everything is going to fall quicker. So we're going to go into a depression, I think. Um, and then my concern is, is that it, it created such havoc in the economy that a lot of countries will say, we can't have that financial hardship again, so we're going to do a forced vaccination program. See, if you notice the, the nomenclature, COVID-19, how they name it, it's already programming in our mind that there'll be a COVID-20 and a COVID-21 and a COVID-22. So you got to go get your vaccination to make sure you save that economy. This is a war against coronavirus. See, see, we're already being programmed in the media to start thinking that once that messenger RNA platform is proven out for the vaccine uh, for 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 this virus, um, I'm concerned that it will have forced vaccinations or you can't go to work. And that's the, the easiest. Fa- that's the fastest way. That's the fastest way to get compliance. It's interesting that you got a financial background. Every day, I used to work in the stock market. Every day, I'm getting messages from people saying, "Should we buy the stock market here?" And I'm saying, "That's catching falling daggers. Don't do it." And every, every day, it's it's going lower and lower. The average bear market lasts about nine months. So, do you you saying you're seeing like a full scale uh, depression scenario? Mm-hmm. Housing prices collapsing, uh, interest rates collapsing. Uh, could you just expand a little bit more on what, what the time frame sure, sure. Is, is there? Sure, and, sure. Um, and, and if there's like a second and a third wave, I mean, we're already at the brink of collapse now. If there's a second, more virulent wave, where would that leave the global economy? Well, I believe that this whole duration of this, of this virus or viruses, because it's probably multiple, um, is going to last 18 to 20 months. And that's basically what happened with the Spanish flu of 1918, okay? Um, But we have a bioengineered one, so it's probably going to be more virulent in the the secondary and tertiary wave. That's my guess. It could attenuate, but my guess is it'll be more virulent Um, because there's multiple receptors. They'll lose affinity for one and gain affinity for another. Um, the, The market... I look at the S&P 500 because I'm in the States. So it's 500 stocks. It's, 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 you know, it has a, it's diversified. So you get a good cross section of the economy versus let's say the Dow 30, which you don't have a good cross section of the economy. When you look at the VIX index, the VIX index, we hit in this period, uh, we hit about 82 on the VIX. Now people that trade realize that that's a lot. So there is such a thing as, acute um, risk and chronic 
uh, you know, elevated risk. Now, we've had a lot of things that have happened in the last 20, 30 years. We had uh, the Gulf War, you know, Desert Storm. We had this, the, the, um, the, the tech bubble. We had 9-11. We had the Afghan war and the Iraq war and Syria. These were all, you know, and then we had Lehman. These were all periods of really uh, 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 elevated, ri uh, elevated risk in the stock market with higher, higher VIX levels. But out of all those, only Lehman gave us an 80, I think it was an 89 on the VIX. That's very high. And we know what happened with the Lehman crash and, and, and housing prices and everything here. So those other events were more, they weren't, they were more acute. They weren't chronic. Lehman was chronic, where it was elevated risk for a long time. So normally risk, it, it spikes for a day or two and then comes back down. It's called heterocydastic. So it comes up and then comes down and then it spikes again another two months or three months, comes back down. So that's when we say buy the dip, right? That's what we mean, you know? But when it's chronic, you start having liquidity problems where a lot of assets, maybe not all, but the majority of assets are all, the, the majority of the assets are falling. So it's very hard to, to position yourself in the economy. So all markets are becoming in disequilibrium or in a, a chaotic attraction, if you want to use uh, terms in, in chaos theory. But um, the VIX is elevated. And the last time we've seen that was Lehman. No matter how much the Federal Reserve or the central banks pump into the economy, it's not going to force people to spend more when we're forced to stay at home or we're sick. The virus doesn't care about the central bank. There's no transmission mechanism. Biology does not care about finance, right? So uh, because of that, we're not going to be able to, to, to stop the fall until the, this pandemic is fixed on the, on, on, the, on the the medical side, on the clinical side of this. Because of that, I believe home prices will start to fall. We're going to have 50% un, unemployment. Um, this is gonna last for 18 to 20 months because of the secondary and tertiary wave. Um, and I'm very worried and, and of the creeping socialism that is starting to happen. You can see it in the news where it's like, okay, here's $1,000 a month. Here is, you know, these massive bailouts. If, you, if, you, if you're familiar with Ayn Rand and Atlas Shrug, almost, it's almost like it's being played out. What happened in that book is like sort of happening today. You had billionaires just or, or, you know, just kind of going missing, <laughs> you know, there's this idea of a new coin, which we might call in, 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 in our terms, maybe decaching, you know, uh, there is this, um, you know, uh, uh, a collapse of the society and, you know, and governments coming in to try to, you know, create these, all these socialistic programs. I, Alice Shrug is like, almost like a, a prophetic you know, vision of what we're living through today. Not exactly, but I mean, there's a lot of similarities. So I'm concerned about the, the creeping socialism. Um, and, you know, because, because of that, it's, we're not going to, we're not going to have that capitalistic society that we may actually have quote a new normal, but it ain't capitalism. It, it may be socialism, you know, and how that, what happens with decaching, with, 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 in, what will happen is it's like, well, we have bills and coins. Well, now everyone's afraid of, of COVID-19 or COVID-20 or 21. So we're told we got to get rid of cash and we got to get rid of coins. But then you're permanently in the banking system. It's almost like the banks need us to, you know, they need that, they need that bail. It's called a bail-in, right? That, that's what, 
And that's what decashing really is, is bailing in the banks. Um, so there's a lot of problems. But I, I suspect that the S&P 500 will go down to 17, 1700 um, and we're, and that will be the, the, I'll reevaluate to see if it goes down more or not, but I, I would not buy until it hits 1700 with, you know, with a, with a reevaluation to see if it's, if it's worth it. But, you know, right now it's around uh, 2300. Um, so it's not going to take that much longer to fall to that with the reevaluation. Now, maybe we're lucky, maybe we're lucky. This is with the assumption that there's going to be a secondary and tertiary wave with, with a lot of deaths and a lot of, a lot of um, infections. I'm expecting 165 million people being infected in the United States. And I, you know, I've been throwing out like really big numbers that people like, are you crazy? In 20 months, I believe 165 million people will be infected. Five, six of those will be mild. One six will be severe. 25% of those will die. Well, if you work out the numbers, it's about 6.9 million people in the United States because of that. The health will have complications from COVID-19 and die from it. That's because they're obese, they have diabetes, they have heart disease, they have kidney problems, yada, yada, yada. So um, that's gonna have a devastating economic um, um, component too. So we're going to, we're, it, this thing is going to echo, you know, once we're done with the path, once we're done with the pathogen, this is going to echo for years, in, you know, in, into the, into the economy before we come back up, you know, where we call the green shoots, you know, Bernanke called it the green shoots. We're talking years before we see a green shoot, if it's at this severity, but if we're lucky, and that there is a therapeutic, you know, there's some talk about this chloroquine, um, uh, you know, being a potential therapeutic you, uh, when it's used in conjunction with uh, antibiotics uh, before remdesivir or a, a vaccine is developed. If we're lucky and we can slow that r not value of, of spreading this virus, because it's around four to six, depending on the data that you look at, um, if we can slow that down and bring it down to one or less, then we can one, not have as much damage to the economy and potentially have an attenuated secondary and tertiary wave. But, I, you know, we got to be really lucky. It's not out of the possibility. We could be, we might get lucky with it, but, um, you know, the worst case in the United States, 6.9 million people die and we're in a depression and we're not getting out of this for about five years. Best case, uh, we you know, are 18 months into this thing um, and we have so much of, of a control with it and we're talking about maybe hundreds, hundreds of thousands, millions of people infected and maybe hundreds of thousands that, that die from it. Um, which is, I think, the, the best case. Um, but that's only if we're lucky with that chloroquine or some other therapeutic. Do you think the death toll will be exacerbated because we've outsourced drug production and medical equipment production to China and that basically now the home economies need to convert their industries into manufacturing those ventilators and the oxygen and, and providing everything else so that the intensive care units aren't overwhelmed? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a realization that Western cultures have been outsourcing for, pro you know, some sort of profit maximization to lower cost centers. Um, we, we have, we have outsourced way too much our, our economies to potential enemies, right? Just to make sure that we're making you know, a quarter, pro you know, that, that quarter profit, the quarterly profit. So, um, yeah, it's a, ma it's a major problem. And I, we're starting to see when Trump became president, we started to see manufacturing slowly coming back into the United States. 
Uh, I don't think anyone had any idea on how much of our pharmaceuticals were being created in India and in China. I mean, really important, you know, pharmaceuticals that, you know, are life saving, you know, and when that supply chain is disrupted, either because of geopolitical issues or because of this pathogenic issue, um, Congress started waking up. Uh, uh, we have a senator uh, in Florida, his name's Rubio, who was uh, a chairman of w one of the committees, and he was really drilling, um, you know, down during the hearing, you know, saying, hey, we need to bring the, the, these, you know, these uh, um, uh, pharmaceuticals back in, into the United States for manufacturing and also the ventilators. Um, I was surprised that you know, that it was, it's hard to, to, to be manufacturing these things in the United States. I mean, it's just, it, we have, we have outsourced way too much, way too much. And it's, it's time to bring it back home. And it's, it's, it's this idea when I was, when I had my, when I did my MBA, we were taught shareholder maximization, you know, uh, complex supply chain management, you know, design in the United States, manufacture in three different areas of the world and, you know, have it assembled and shipped. And it, you know what, it's a, that's a fragile system when you're talking about just in time, there's, you know, they, they squeezed out the redundancy for profit, but you need redundancy when to absorb shocks. I mean, would you drive your car on a road that, that has a bunch of potholes with no shock absorbers? No, of course not. But that's basically what we did with our economy. We took the shock absorbers off, saying that the cost of shock absorbers is too much. That's what, what happened. Mm. And now we hit a major pothole and that car, we, we, you know, we, we hit that, we got that, 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 that G force from that. And, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, living through it, but we need redundancy. If you look at biological systems, there's redundancy when it's making chemicals in the cell and communicating with other tissues. There, and there are recycles, but you need that, des that redundancy. You need that ability to, to absorb exogenous shocks or endogenous shocks. But I mean, you need those shock absorbers. Um, it, it's, a, it's a sad state that the Western civilization's in. And um, I, the, the problem is because you know, you, you know about finance too. Uh, those analysts on Wall Street or even, you know, even in, in London, you know, they, they, they do those, those conference calls and they say, well, your top line isn't, you know, growing fast enough and you're not cutting your costs enough. So we're going to, you know, cut our expectations, your EPS earnings per share down. And, you know, so it pushes the CFO and the, the CEO to reduce the shock, the shock absorber. So it's the analysts that are part of the problem. They also, you know, they, they, they might be also the solution too, because we're starting to realize that profit maximization costs. Just because you, you squeeze the costs out and now you have quarterly, you know, more quarterly profits, you're going to pay it in the end when there is this, this catastrophic thing that happens because you created a more fragile system. So... Uh, you know, they cause the problem, but they can be also part of the solution by saying, well, what happens if you do have these shocks? How are you going to, how, how, how are you going to uh, uh, adapt? And it forces uh, going back to having a redundancy within the, the just in time system. So, um, but it is a problem. I, I totally agree with you. And if China decided to say, you know what, we're not going to give you your, your medicines because we don't like you. Well, tell that to grandma who needs the heart medication and then she dies because China didn't want to give it. You know? So in conclusion then, on this channel I've been saying whether it was um, from a weapons lab or whether it was from the animal world, the main focus should be on preparedness and what advice do you have for people watching this video how to minimize damage to themselves? Well, let's start, to be, to be honest, in the United States, in certain regions of the country, it's almost too late. It's almost too late because we're already in what they call shelter in place. So you can, and there's, there are rationing. 
you know, there, there, there's rationing going on. Food, you know, I, I live in Manhattan. Food is starting to run out at certain stores, not all grocery stores, but like uh, Whole Foods, which is, which is a big grocery store chain here, uh, they're running out of food. People are starting to, to hoard, so there's, there's quotas on what you, can, what you can buy. There's rationing there. Um, toilet paper and, and paper products is running out. But in other areas of the United States, they don't have that problem or as, as severe yet. But in the high density areas, they do. So uh, it's a, almost a little too late, let's say in Manhattan. But you, you need, it looks like the shelter in place that's happening in the United States is going to last anywhere from uh, uh, 14 days to 30 days. But, you know, they, they, they use the term for the foreseeable future. Now, what does that mean? We don't really know. All right. So you need at least four weeks of food in your in your home. Um, but it's possible that we're locked down for eight weeks. You know, p- people are telecommuting, but, you know, there's lots of layoffs and people are worried that they're not going to be able to afford their mortgages or rent. You know, so they're cutting expenses and stuff and they don't have the they don't have the funds for preparation. So it's a big problem that now. That's why I said it's kind of a little too late for some regions, for some people. But having four weeks of food is really important in toiletries. Um, but for uh, the um, if you're sick, you need to try to get medical care. All right. Because the doctors and nurses will have much more potent medicines, the antivirals, um, the antibiotics. They have a much more potent um, uh, medicines that one can get. But when the medical system starts to break down, and we're already hearing signs of it in the United States, um, you'll only have the homeopathic to, to lean on if you can't see a doctor. So making sure that you, you know, are stocked up on your vitamins, your minerals, your, you know, your anti-inflammatory, you know, type um, homeopathic remedies like uh, turmeric, um, you know, um, you know, the vitamin C's, um, that's important for just overall health. But if you're sick, I, I analyzed a paper. All right. A while back, about four or five weeks ago, with some researchers that are in Europe, and it was dealing with uh, terpenoids and, and lignoids, and there were 22 compounds that had uh, in vitro, which is outside the body, um, uh, proof that it killed off uh, coronaviruses. All right. Now there are different types of coronaviruses. Okay. We are dealing with a SARS version. Okay, there's a MERS, there's a SARS, there's the everyday benign, you know, coronavirus. But what's unique about them is, is that there, there, there is a um, an area of the g- genome where it's conserved, and it's called the the three CL protease part of the genome. Well, if you have a protease inhibitor and you have a conserved region for all these coronaviruses, if you inhibit that you slow down the replication. So these terpenoids and lignoids will, are protease inhibitors, but they're lower dose than the protease inhibitors that the doctor can provide. But um, there are off the shelf nutraceuticals or homeopathics that people can buy that have these compounds in it. And one of them is forskolone, the other is relora, calendula, uh, birch bark extract, and licorice root. If you get those, and they're still available, let's say like on Amazon or other, you know, um, uh, health food stores, that will help if you can't get to a doctor. I'm not saying it's a cure, and I'm not saying that it's better than what you're going to get from a doctor. What I'm saying is, is it's, it's something is better than nothing when you're sick. Um, making sure that you have filtered water 
drinking fresh water. You stay away from the, the fluoride type waters. That, it, that is an endocrine disruptor. So um, having filtered water and, and I, I take iodine supplements um, to just have a healthy thyroid. But those are the things that you can do anti-inflammatory to make sure that you reduce that cytokine storm in that second wave. Um, and the protease inhibitors that are in natural supplements or, 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 or you know, nutraceuticals that one can get that I just mentioned um, are ways to, you know, and, and other antivirals that are in the homeopathic world that people know about. Thieves oil is another one. So um, those are things that people can get. It's not a cure, but it's at least uh, a tool in the toolbox that people can use to try to help with fighting this pathogen. Uh, boosting up your immune system with, uh, with um, products like uh, nano silver or um, structured silver. Um, sometimes you, people can buy products that, are, that have this nano silver in a gel or in a liquid form. That is known to boost your immune system. And if you have a, health, if you have a boost immune system or a, a supported immune system, um, you are able to fight pathogens better. If you have a weakened immune system, obviously you'll get sicker more often. So the key is, you know, try to get as healthy as you can before you get hit by it. It's like a charged battery. If it's fully charged and then you get hit by the virus, you know, it goes down like this. But if your immune system is already low and then you get hit by the virus, you just don't have the energy to fight it. So it's, it's preparation in that, in that regard, too. So in the description box below this video are links to your YouTube channel and links to all of your socials. If people want to get a hold of you, what is your preferred method, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube? Um, the best way is um, actually on my website. They, they can, you know, they, they can uh, just hit the contact button and, and, and write an email and, then you know, I look at that. Okay. I appreciate so your time. Appreciate your time. As a disclaimer, I'd just like to say that I am not a doctor. Um, if you do have a medical situation, I urge you to consult a range of experts, not just get one expert opinion. Also, some of the people watching this video may find it extremely controversial or upsetting if they've lost people to the coronavirus already. And to those people, I just say on this channel, we're just trying to get people on with a range of perspectives so we can come to a more informed decision to better our own preparedness for what the whole world is suffering through right now. And if you've got any other guests you would like me to interview who have perspectives similar or the opposite to what you've heard today, I will be happy to have those people on the channel as well. Just um, email over some contact details. So thank you very much for your time. And um, wh whatever's going down in your neighborhood, I hope it doesn't get too heavy. And um, it's, 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 I mean, we, we, we started the lockdown where, where we have 100% non essential workers in the state of New York are told not to work, not to go to work. And not everyone can tell a, you know, commute, you know, and, and, and or telework. So um, the layoffs are, you're just starting to see um, layoffs happening in New York City. Uh, and we have about 23,000 restaurants that are affected 23,000 restaurants i mean that's a lot there's a lot of people that are employed in that you know in bars and that sort of thing so so it's 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 going to affect the economy for sure